Welcome to the Cop Think Podcast, where we answer the question, why do the police do what they do? I'm Brian Casey. With me is Chris Culkins. And Chris, uh, you're, you're back with us. You spoke earlier. And um, this is kind of like a part two because you had so many interesting things to say. Very helpful. Yeah. Thank you for uh, letting me stay and drink more of your coffee. Yeah. I'm impressed that you drink coffee this late. It doesn't... It might, I might... Um... I might meet the diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for caffeine dependence. I don't care. I'm not going to do anything about it. So yeah. Nobody save me. But yes. Okay, nobody yes. save me. I think Terry <laughs> went to get you some more. So you do a lot of things. You're a husband and father. Yes. Uh, could you mention your daughter coming to pick you up the other day? She is. She's 22. Uh, um, pick you up yeah. because you lost your keys, I should say. I and, did. You're not supposed to tell people um, my down my my weaknesses. No, no, we want to like you because you, uh, you come <laughs> off just the opposite. So it's it makes it's makes you more endearing. What uh, and then you are a paramedic, but you also uh, train paramedics. I am. I'm full time. I teach paramedics. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's that's uh, what I do. And walk fast and carry clipboard, as I said before. Mm-hmm. So um, the subject uh, of, I guess I call it officer suicide prevention, but uh, you've convinced me that we should just talk generally about public safety workers. Let me ask you, is suicide preventable? Yes. Suicide is preventable. Uh, It's actually more preventable than, um, and, and you're more likely to save somebody than a cardiac arrest, you know, 10% on a good day, right? That's what we save in Minnesota. And we're way ahead of the curve. I mean, if you're going to have a cardiac arrest, Minnesota turns out is a pretty good place to have it, but it's still only 10%, right? Uh, major depressive disorder, number one mental illness associated with uh, suicide, 80 to 90% treatable. So. Well, that's, and you're talking to an old paramedic. So that's actually, I never framed it that way. Um, and I think it's really good to hear that you say that it's treatable, even depression too, because one is, uh, it's so important to people to be able to relate to success stories. Um, also just to plain, to have that knowledge that people can get to a better spot. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I'm aware of, especially with uh, dealing with people that are maybe depressed or have, have, are feeling suicidal is that they sometimes need another person out to help them get their chin up a little bit, not Pollyannish way, but help them to see a little through the fog a little better. I noticed that even as a patrol officer, complete strangers would sometimes officer just tell me what to do. You know, they would basically turn themselves over to you or to your good intentions to get them to a better spot. So it is, it's hope. It, is it a hopeful message? Even though the big message that we get is that it's out of control on the rise. I really like talking to you about this subject because uh, you're able to talk about it in a way that is really useful and and um, it's not not overly uh, what would be the word for it. You don't look as pain stricken as, as as I might imagine someone could be if you're talking about this subject and you're also your history in regard to it. Sure. Yeah. No. Um, for sure. Uh, you know, if you look at the statistics. In 2017, the, the year there's the, late, the, the most current data for national trends, uh, there's 47,000 suicides in the United States, right? And uh, we believe that's 10 to 30% higher because of um, misclassified suicides, which are intentionally misclassified or accidentally misclassified. I'm sure many officers out there listening will, will reflect back on the single car accident on a dry road on a clear day, right? Um, so there's ones that go... Um, unnoticed, um, you know, in comparison to 17,000 murders, 32,000 traffic deaths, 3,800 fire deaths a year, uh, you know, those kinds of things, um, and 42,000 breast cancer deaths a year that same year. But think of the population of the United States. Now, the 2010 census, because, well, because I'm nerdy, is like 320 million people, right? So there's obviously more people than that. So 47,000 plus 10 to 30% died of suicide, but how many million did not? 319 million something, whatever. Um, so it's a problem. It's a big problem. There's more people dying. Of, it's a public health problem. Um, there's more people dying of suicide than a lot of other things, but there's a lot of people who don't die of suicide. 
and we need to study that too. Well, is it, do you think of it as, is this a bunch of individuals out there that are suicidal or, or do you think that it's a society that is sick and that's a symptom of a sick society? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little of both. Um, Certainly in, a, in a, a study of uh, the CDC did for suicides from 2001 to I believe it was 17, 56% uh, of those who died by suicide had a diagnosed mental illness. Um, but that's a far cry from all of them, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That means 44% didn't. Now, you can argue some of those probably had a diagnosis, but they weren't diagnosed. But there are cultural reasons, too. Uh, so that is culture is part of it. Uh, people don't often think of of that, uh, and then there's there's different kinds of suicides. There's even the altru altruistic, right? Um, you you jump in in front of a car to push your buddy out of the way, and you die knowing what's going to happen. That's a suicide. It's altruistic. Hmm. It's not a mental illness. Um, and so many people get caught up in it must be a mental illness, not necessarily. And I haven't even touched the whole death with dignity, no matter what side of the ethics you fall sure. on there. I haven't even touched those people. And I, I don't think they're mentally ill, if anything. Um, and we can debate all day long, of course, the, the rights and wrongs of that. But uh, I don't believe they're mentally Well, let me see if I understand. So you're saying not all, everyone that dies by suicide um, is mentally ill. Yes. And you gave that one example, which obviously was a really rare one, the, um, jumping inside the car. But there are other altruistic things, maybe even certain high risk police behavior or soldiering behavior or others, you know. Well if you went in knowing you were gonna die. Yeah. To save somebody? Yeah. I'm guessing there's a few officers like that. <laughs> Probably to understate it, right? Hmm. That's why we got into this work. Yeah. Right. Could that be? Well maybe. Doesn't mean we're mentally ill. What um but obvious is it fair to say obviously, I mean when the people that I have dealt with interacted with that are suicidal, they're in extreme distress and psychological pain. Is that, let me just help me understand the mental illness part of, or am I just using the word mental illness wrong? Yeah. No, I, I don't, mental illness can certainly cause pain. Uh, you know, the, the top four mental illnesses associated with suicide, major depressive disorder, borderline personality disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Number four, people are going to be surprised to hear nicotine dependence. Now, is that a chicken or the egg? And that's a symptom. You know, you can argue that. If I had to do five and six, I'd say um, alcohol use, substance abuse, and schizophrenia. Uh, so those are, so I gave you six. I'll give you a bonus two there. Um, yeah. But um, those are the most common um, mental illnesses. But there's some sort of style states where I don't believe it's related uh, to uh, mental illness. Um, you know, it's about making the pain stop in some cases. Right. It's about something we call a psych ache. Uh, and there's certainly- let's, let's say it again. Psych ache. Psych ache. Like yeah. psychology yeah, and sure. an ache. So psych ache, it was actually a, uh, a name coined by Edwin Schneidman. Uh, and he was the founder of the American Association of Suicidology and really established suicidology as a field, a discipline. And uh, that's what he called it. And I think it's- uh, uh, it's still a, a timely um, description of what's sure. going on with somebody who right. dies of suicide. So, um, so those were the mental health disorders associated with suicide. Those are different than risk factors. Yes. Right. So tell us what the risk factors are. Uh, well, if you want handy little acronym, because public safety people love acronyms, don't they? I would say is PATH. Warm. So that stands for ideation, evidence of ideation. It might be passive, like I'm not going to be here tomorrow, or it could be very so overt. Let's, we use the word ideation a lot. It means having the idea. Yeah, or a suicidal thought. Okay. Uh, then there's S, which is substance use. 29% of people who die by suicide are positive for alcohol at the time of their death. When I said positive, I didn't say they were intoxicated. Mm -hmm. And then that means 71% are not, hmm. right? But we know alcohol increases impulsivity and decreases inhibitions. Sometimes it's called the lubricant to suicidality, if you will. Uh, so we look for that. I throw in a second S, which is sleep problems. Good. And then we go for purposelessness, which we talked about in the first episode. 
Uh, so what is my purpose in life? That can be a job, a family. It can be more existential, a religious purpose. It can be a lot of things, right? Uh, and it can be more than one thing. Uh, the A is for anxiety. The T is for feeling trapped in a job, in a relationship, in a geographic location, any kind of a situation that would cause stress. So that would be a risk factor. H stands for hopelessness. So I may have a purpose, but I have no hope I'm going to attain it or the means to do that. Maybe that happens if you suffer financial problems, for example, right? So these things are interrelated. Um, or you're in a, get an injury and you can't carry out your purpose or you don't have the hope for that. Hope's important. Uh, and then uh, W is more of a symptom. It's withdrawing suddenly. So uh, if somebody uh, normally goes out and, I don't know, plays volleyball after work uh, or meets you at the gym and, and lifts weights with you, uh, and they stop doing that, where they come, stop coming around to departmental functions or family functions. Uh, that could be a, a warning sign. Uh, young people, it's, sometimes it's unplugging from social media, mm -hmm. believe it or not. I mean, that's a blessing and a curse, social media, but it can sure. provide connection. I, and then uh, the second A is anger, and it's usually anger disproportionate to what's going on. So I ask you to go get me a burger and fries. You forget the flat fries and I just flip the whole table over and lose it. Right. That would be a little disproportionate to what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we can probably all think of names. Uh, <laughs> did you get him his coffee by the way? Now that she did. Him. No, I just, just don't want to. <laughs> she did. Sorry. It's right here. I was just preemptively. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you don't want me to get angry. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We're hangry. Right. Um, so, and then, um, so that's anger. And then R is reckless behavior. Uh, so that would be things you have to take it in totality. So it's what do you normally do and what do you do now? So if you normally wear your seatbelt and now you don't, if you normally wear a helmet when you ATV, motorcycle, snowmobile, and now you don't, I'm trying to save everybody who doesn't wear a helmet when they motorcycle, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you'll just make them mad, uh, but not the kind of mad that's in the warm. Um, so you got to take it in totality. Uh, other reckless behaviors uh, that we look for would be um, – Sex with multiple people that's unprotected, which is clearly a risky behavior. Somebody suddenly takes up extreme sports, that would be a reckless behavior. Uh, so, you know, taking chances on the job in the case of law enforcement and other public safety, that would be uh, that would be an example of reckless behavior. And then Emma's mood swings, high to low. Right. Wow, that's a, that was an impressive list and it was helpful. The one thing when you were going through the list, I thought um, some of the associated things seem like things you might be born with or struggle with maybe for life. I don't know if that's true. But uh, risk factors, some of them I thought, wow, if you were able to talk to another person about that, you could really help. You could maybe see it different and manage it different. Yeah, think about those. Um, that is path warm. Yeah. acronym when you're talking to people yeah and you know even if they're not in trouble maybe it's just a good thing to talk to them about and they might think you're a great person right because <laughs> wow this person's really interested in me and asking all these questions well you or, know yeah uh, you know, cops in particular maybe in particular but they um they act like um they're so self-protective and they're so closed down and not op talk openly about it but one thing i like to remind them is that i'll have to explain this because it may not make sense that Mammals gather and humans talk. So when mammals are harmed, especially herd type animals, they just group up next to each other. Right. You know, that makes sense. You know, they, 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 when, they, when they're harmed, they just need to be near other mammals. And humans then add that one thing where they, they talk about it. And I think whether cops or public safety workers, believe it or not, they actually have a huge impulse to share their distress verbally. Sometimes I think we do it um, in a roundabout way, too. Think about people who share war stories. Uh, somebody once told me that, um, and this was for paramedics, but I think it's true of other responders, too. Uh, when we teach other paramedics, whether it be field training or whatever it is, the stories that we tell, uh, unless they're funny or something like that, um, we usually tell the stories that are most profound to us, that impacted us some way. And oh often that's trauma, right? I mean, think about it. Um, 
how we do that. I was just listened to something Jordan Peterson put out about listening, and he talked about if you listen and you're an effective listener, it's amazing what people will tell you. What's the great book, the Vietnam era book, about the things they carry? Yeah, O'Brien. O'Brien. So Tim for, is it Tim O'Brien? I think yeah, it's Tim O'Brien. For, yeah, I read for that. public safety workers, just be the stories they tell. You know, maybe yeah. we t- we're storytellers. Yeah. We all are, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a benefit. There's this kind of vicarious learning that takes place when you share a story like, okay, you know, placenta placenta previa is not a very common obstetrics emergency, but by hearing that story, I think I'm a little better if I ever have one of those, that kind of thing. So I thought I would see value in that, but even in law enforcement and also, well, there's a number of reasons they do it. Uh, Some of it's boasting, some of it's just fun and entertaining, but some of it, I really like what, uh, one time I was in a group of officers once uh, at another city because we were doing some peer support training. And uh, everybody said, well, this, I don't know if it's a good idea. It seemed like a good idea. They said, well, everybody just talk about the most impactful call they had. Mm -hmm. Some therapists said, oh, don't do that. It's going to traumatize people. I'm thinking, I don't know. People with broken arms are pretty good at not moving them sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. People with pain sometimes... They let out what they're willing to let out. So I, I wasn't as cautious. And I remember this one cop told a story, happened to be in Minneapolis, where he told the story, the worst call he'd ever been on. Amazingly, I had been a paramedic in Minneapolis uh, before I became a cop. And that call was the call that I had been on, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I didn't hardly remember it, uh, which was kind of intriguing to me because I'm thinking, what? Uh, it was a lady that jumped out a window with her baby. You know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And uh, it was just intriguing that uh, the stories that they tell. And um, even when I'm aware that when I'm talking to an audience of cops, that I actually don't want to prompt them necessarily to remember or to start talking about some of their stories because I think, you know, they all have these kind of painful stories and memories. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, um, you know, two people can go to the same call and have a totally different experience. And oftentimes it's that identification hook. If you identify with that person that you're on the call with, that's what gets us. You know, if it's uh, my daughter's 22 and if it's a car accident, there's a fatality and it's a 22 year old woman, that's going to shake me a lot more than somebody who doesn't have kids. Mm-hmm. Where I identify right. because we depersonalize. We have to to do our jobs, right? Or we just cry. Right. Uh, so we depersonalize. And I think identifying repersonalizes more with pe- people, it makes them a person again. Cause we can't do, you know, cause we have to do that to, to get moving on. That's why we say, put the hip in room five, right? Oh, it's also evidence of compassion fatigue, but right. that's why we do that. But you know, I've never, I've always been pretty, pretty forgiving of that where I even feel, I feel, I, I see that I understand why public safety workers, they don't want to be too connected to some of that. I know? agree. And it's probably it's self-protective. I say sense. build your wall up. You know, that's fine. Build your wall up. Make dang sure you can see over it. And every once in a while, take some bricks out. Uh, right? Just don't wall yourself in. Yeah, that's I, nice. I know it's... Did you come up with that on your own? I, yeah. I, am I, I, that's my one thing for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, here's, here's my version of that, um, especially with law enforcement. There's this really necessary uh, cynicism, suspicion. I mean, if your loved one is a police officer, you don't want them approaching strangers for a living, which they do, and then be like coming up with a great positive attitude that everything's going to go fine, you know? Right. Um, and so that cyn- cynicism is really useful. It's part of a um, problematic adaptation of being a good cop. Mm-hmm. And ambulance workers have similar things. Firefighters have similar things. But the deal is just go ahead and have that. Make it, it's a useful thing. It's something you wear on your duty belt. But ideally, you would leave it in the locker before you go home. You know, easier so you, said than done, but I agree. Yeah. Uh, why is it easier said than done? I think for some people, it's easier said than done. I mean, the hypervigilance, success, especially if you have post-traumatic stress like, like I do, uh, sometimes it's hard to put that in the locker because your brain won't let you. Um, you know, we know that the hippocampus area of the brain, the emotional regulatory system, we know on MRI it actually shrinks with post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. But we also know that therapy can build that back up again. 
like eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy, EMDR. EM, uh-huh. EMDR. Yeah. Okay. So, so we know that, but that makes it hard to put up. So yeah. I do agree with you, but I, um, I also, um, want to acknowledge there might be people listening, which I'm sure you, you agree with that, um, might be struggling with post-traumatic stress and they're going like, yeah, like that's, it's, that's a great. Yeah. I think advice, what, happens, but- what happens <laughs> is that our, our brain makes decisions for us and our conscious mind observes those decisions and thinks it was in charge Yeah, and, and actually <laughs> made the decision where actually it came from a, a deeper animal impulse or. So tell us, talk about post-traumatic stress and the connection that has with suicide. Yeah, well, it's one of the top four mental health issues connected with suicide. I'd like to call it post-traumatic, if I could rename it. Um, and this isn't original. Other people have said sure. this, but I agree with it. Post-traumatic stress injury. Remember yeah. I said the hippocampus shrinks? It's an injury, and it yeah. can be rebuilt. Uh, so um, my hippocampus shrunk, um, and it grew a bit more. Again, yeah. I don't think I'll ever get it 100% back, but I'm effective. I can do So with job. a shrunken hippocampus mm-hmm. what was the uh, what was that what was demonstrated with that <laughs> uh so think hypervigilance sure for example now i know that's a norm can be a normal part of well vigilance is yeah but being hyper vigilant right. like extra vigilant yeah sure. um taking it home with you right sure yeah and i know you talk about that in your book uh mm-hmm. for sure um so that's that's a must look at part right. I don't know if you're reading um you know so that's something um but also it's if you're triggered and something uh, tr- triggers you uh you have a hard time shutting off mm-hmm. your limbic system your mm-hmm. hippocampus and your amygdala which is sounding the alarm which is like danger 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 and your prefrontal co- cortex is supposed to say hey calm down here um everything's safe and for you star wars fans these are not the droids you're looking for <laughs> um right google it for any young police officers out there um but anyway um you know so we don't get to shut that down and we get this cascade of fight flight or freeze mm-hmm. and that's the most problematic for us but those are three pretty common actions you fight you flight or you freeze and then freeze usually causes the most distress because like I was supposed to do something right. Mm-hmm. But that's actually a normal, it's a normal abnormal thing. <laughs> well, I think sense. it's very fair that you brought that up about, uh, it's easier said than done type of thing. And that, um, um, you know, I think if you listen to read any of Sebastian Younger's stuff, he, he, writes about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder in a way that I hang on every word of it, you know, and that some of the, re- some of the behaviors and experiences associated with it are um, what you would want to experience if you were in danger, you know. The problem is that it's, you're not in danger, but you're still experiencing it. Maybe it's, that's a simplistic way of saying it. So I am sympathetic to that. And... Um, but so let's talk, you brought it up because I just want to put this out there because I'm surprised that some of the therapeutic organizations and even law enforcement, public safety that don't know about smooth eye movement therapies. Um, and I don't do, never, I tried in the book to explain it and I think I did a fairly good job. I don't know if I could do it now, but essentially you, um, there's some therapeutic processes that I call it beyond talk therapy or non-talk therapy where smooth eye movement like EMDR or uh, some people are familiar with ART, accelerated resolution therapy, where you make use of that smooth eye movement to kind of access a part of the brain. So those uh, painful memories or the associated emotions can be kind of, I'll just, I hate to say the word, but I will just normally processed. Oh, I So I, you can be yeah. released from it. You know, you don't forget the memory. Um, but you do have the, uh, you still have the memory, so you don't lose that, but you don't necessarily have the original emotion to come up with it. Sure. It's um, the best description I've ever heard. I'll, I'll steal from one of my board members, uh, Jesse Breyer Peterson, who's a licensed psychologist. Uh, he, when you go through a trauma, it's like you, you have a brain that's perfectly organized. You get files that are alphabetized, numbers, color coded, everything's meticulous, right? And when you have a trauma, those files, get, that box gets dumped on the ground and papers go flying everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. And then you gather them up the best you can. You throw them back in the box and it isn't pretty, right? Um, so what EMDR does is it works both sides of your brain. Your brain's crosswired, as you know. So the left, your left side controls the right and your right brain controls the left. And you'll move your eyes as you're re- recounting uh, some guided uh, therapy. Um, Often you don't have to verbalize or even you, talk about You it. don't have to. You can right. if you want. I did. Um, I had my therapist ask me questions and I just answered. And you kind of think about your experience. And what happens is, is you're thinking on both sides of your brain. You bring those thoughts up. Uh, and it's believed that you're reprocessing those and slowly putting those files back where they belong. Now, EMDR is a evidence-based therapy. It's shown to work. And I, and I remember telling my, my therapist, um, this feels like voodoo insert swear right. word here. Um, but it works, right? It's voodoo stuff that works. Right. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of evidence behind it too. Cause I'm like the ultimate skeptic. Um, sure. It worked for me. Little disclaimer results may not be typical, but well, what's nice about it too is that it um, it can turn the volume down too. So other so talk therapy can even be more effective because the volume or the static is not so great with uh, yeah with intrusive thoughts or so. Yeah. Just we can leave this here, but let me just remind the audience that we're talking about EMDR, which you can you can evil Google that and. Uh, ART is, uh, you can, that's accelerated resolution therapy. Yeah. Yep. Um, did, now we talked about pain before, and I don't know if you want to talk more about psychic and going into that. Yeah. So differentiate that. Why do you point, why do you say the word psychic? In front? Uh, so uh, psychic is an unbearable psychological pain where your only thought is making the pain stop. In the way of an analogy, and I've used this, and I'm sorry to people who have heard me speak before because you might get tired of this, but it works. So pretend just for a moment that everybody listening to this uh, is has an unbearable, well, just pretend there's a couple rules. First, you won't die no matter what I do to you. Temporary immortality. Second <laughs> rule, how's that for oxymoronic? Second rule is whatever I, I'm sadistic. And whatever I do to you, you're not going to be able to stop me. Okay. Now, so put away your tasers, your all the, <laughs> right. You just can't do it. It's not part of the rules. Um, and then last, you're never going to believe it's going to stop. So what I'll do is I whip out a ball peen hammer and Brian, you're first. Mm-hmm. And I just hit you on top of the head as hard as I can. Mm-hmm. And then the next person in the audience and on and on. Maybe I do it every five minutes. Maybe I give you know, you're pretty nice and you gave me coffee. So I'll, I'll, I'll wait an hour and then I'll clock you again because I'm feeling generous, but I'm going to keep doing it. And I would hypothesize to the people listening to this, that at some point, if I kept doing that, you felt every bit of that skull splitting pain and you thought it was not going to stop. You would take your lives at some point. Some Mm -hmm. of you earlier, some of you later, it's all about what making the pain stop. Uh, that's what it's about. And as that hammer hits your head, you're not thinking of your fellow officer. That's your buddy. You're not thinking of your spouse. Right. You're not thinking of your kids. You can't. All you can think about is that pain. And and some people, um, they disagree with me. I say, well, let's go out to my car. I'll keep slamming your hand in the door. And when you scream for me to stop, I'm going to tell you, stop being selfish and start thinking about your family. But that doesn't work. Right. So (laughs) let's take that analogy. So, um, I had a migraine headache once mm-hmm. and I, I don't have migraines, but I had a migraine headache. I remember in the midst of that, I came to that same realization. You thought I understand how people would do anything to escape that. How in the analogy you gave is banging on the head with the hammer, which that's not a great analogy because you'd render them unconscious, but let's say you bang them on well, the that's foot the other or the hand. You won't go unconscious. Oh yeah. You said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, say so I wasn't listening, but what, um, how is psychic pain different or if not worse? And I'll tell you one thing I noticed. The worst thing about people that it, I think, we're, whether it's low back pain or depression, it's hard. You, you believe it's your new normal. I mean, if you knew you were just enduring even severe depression for a period of time, you could go, I'll get through this. Right. But you believe this is your, it's hard in the midst of it not to see it as your new normal. And I suppose that's hopelessness too that comes with that. But how is psychic pain 
different. It's, Maybe even it, if you don't mind a little bit about your experience with psychic pain or psychic pain, psychic, yeah, psychic, as opposed to psychic. Pain, oh, yeah, because um, <laughs> would be a little. That's a, I, I, that's a little different power you have. Um, but uh, yes, <laughs> a psychic, um, psychic. Yes, we talked about that in the first ones. So yeah, good. Um, so um, I will tell you what. Uh, I don't firefight anymore. And the reason I don't firefight anymore is because a tree found my ATV. Alcohol was not involved for those curious. Uh, I may have said, hey, watch this, but nonetheless. Yeah, you said, hey, what's that line? Hey, oh, my beer, hey, watch my, this. Yeah. But this, I didn't, oh, I didn't drink. So okay. just, hey, watch this. But anyway, I hit a tree. Uh, I went over the handlebars. Uh, fortunately, I was wearing my helmet. Hit my helmet hard, um, but hit the top of my shoulder. Fractured it really badly. Plate and 11 screws later. Uh, I got launched sideways. Broke my left wrist, punctured the bursa in my knee, split my lip wide open. You could see my teeth. It looked like a sideways mouth. Uh, all this stuff. That is the 10 on a 10 pain scale. That is the worst physical pain I have ever experienced in my life. Hands down. When my wife died of suicide, that was the most psychological pain I have ever experienced in my entire life. I would tell you with all honesty, I would crash my ATV into that tree 10 more times rather than go through a one more death of my wife. Psychological pain is that powerful. If you think about medical folks, and I've said this in front of rooms of doctors, paramedics, nurses, and nobody's disagreed with me. So I'm just going to keep saying it until somebody does. Um, how many people have you seen die of physical pain? Other than if it physical pain causes psychological pain, it doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen. How many people do you know that have died of psychological pain? A lot. That's the power of it. Hmm. Uh, and if we think about it in those terms. Well, um, that's helpful uh, and painful. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I hurt just thinking about all this stuff. Well, <laughs> I guess the... I don't know, chronic pain, you talked about as a risk factor too. Yes. Um, but we're talking about this psychic pain. What about public safety workers and their desensitization, help me say the word. Desensitization. To pain. Yeah. I mean, um, that's, a, that's actually a, a necessary job skill. Is that, do you think? I mean, I mean, you don't, to be empathic, means you feel another person's feeling and you don't really want that. Right. Uh, you want to be understanding and helpful and all that. But part of the job is, is, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, turning that off or insulating yourself or mm -hmm. I not inoculating yourself to some of that exposure. But. So there's a, a researcher named Thomas Joyner. Dr. Joyner has got a theory called the interpersonal, uh, psychological theory of suicidal behavior. It's held up over a thousand times to empirical research. That's a lot. Uh, and what he found is the, that people who die by suicide have three things that line up. The first is a thwarted sense of belongingness, which is social pain, this member connection, as we talked about before. The second is a perceived sense of burdensomeness. It doesn't even have to be real. It's just you think you're a burden, another form of social pain. And the third is the ability to enact lethal self harm. Now, suicide is a inherently um, fearsome act, as Joyner would say. He likes to say that inherently fearsome. I like that word, those words. Um, if you came to my class when I teach EMT students how to do blood sugars, you'd see people like rocking the needle in shortly, slowly, trying to pick a scab when I'm not looking. That's just a needle stick, right? Um, but if somebody checks their blood sugar on a regular basis and is my classroom, what do they do? Here's, here's both my hands, 10 fingers. Here, let me get my socks off. Mm -hmm. Oh, dude, put the sock back on. Um, you know, that's what will happen. Why can that person do it? And why can they take all those needle sticks? Because they're desensitized. It's like eating hot peppers, right? The more you eat, the more you can eat. Uh, taking a roller coaster ride. You're afraid of the roller coaster. It's a giant roller coaster. Uh, what do you do? You watch people, right? Desensitizing yourself. And then you go on small roller coasters, the kitty one, wee, and then a bigger one and a bigger one, bigger one. You take one. And then what do you do? Once you took the ride, most people go on it like 20 more times, right? Um, you're desensitizing yourself. I'm going to say that I believe the majority of people listening to this are not afraid of death. We don't want to die necessarily. 
but we've had a f- upfront and personal view of it so many times. If you've done this job for a long time, we become desensitized to pain, to death. And when that happens, on top of the perceived sense of burdensomeness and the thwarted sense of belongingness, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, so, you know, I think that's, that's important. What uh, about, so where does this fit in? I would call it muted alarm systems. I mean, if you worked in uh, hospitals, I don't know if the ambulances have a lot of alarms. They didn't when I worked it, but, you know, you just have, you hear so many, you don't hear it anymore. And I've often thought about, I'll just say ambulance or police work. You know, you can be a married guy with kids and you go to work and suddenly you're doing things that, that are really unnatural, like right. going into dark places, crossing thresholds, looking for trouble. And um, in order to do that, you kind of have to have this muted alarm system. And then add these other things that you mentioned, uh, the, Dr. Joyner, was that mm-hmm. it? Yeah. Um, one that stood out of all those three that you mentioned is the burden thing. That reminded me of kind of uh, one of the alarming things that someone will say when you're talking to them and you're uh, maybe assessing their level of risk mm-hmm. is that they, they feel like they're a burden, that people will be better off without them. I just heard that recently. You know? My wife said it to me. She said, you'll be better off without me. Mm-hmm. It wasn't true. Uh, I didn't feel that way, but it doesn't matter. It's what they perceive, right? Uh, and sometimes the reason that you miss those signs we talked about earlier, that people feel guilty because I should have picked up on this or that with my coworker, maybe that person was trying in an odd sort of way to help you, like they didn't want to be more of a burden on you. So therefore, they weren't telling you everything going on with them because in a twisted different kind of way they were trying to actually help you i uh, didn't want to saddle you with that i bet that's come up in your uh, you said you lead a um what did you call them survivors or what yeah a peer support group for people bereaved by suicide bereaved by suicide i bet that's i bet you've helped people see that they certainly report that yeah um i think maybe they helped me well, i mean that's just that, a really yes, that's yes. really a kind of discovery <laughs> that only i think Someone like you with your experience and maybe me now listening to this can pick up on it's fascinating. Right. That they, you know, I, I, I do like to, you want to unburden people a little bit because um, and that's why I started out saying is suicide preventable because we, we know it can be prevented, but it can't always be prevented because this is a, we can't control another human. Right. Not, there's so many variables, right. And you have to pick up on it. Right. Um, Oftentimes, I, I go in and I speak to, uh, in a couple of days here, I'll, uh, I'll be at um, the VA uh, talking to some of the uh, psychiatrists. And, uh, and, I've, and I've gone to a lot of um, great mental health clinics uh, in the cities here to talk to the mental health providers. And the first thing I tell them, because they feel so guilty if one of their patients dies of suicide, I get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I tell them is, you know, do you think that the best oncologist in the world can save everybody. You think that I'm saving everybody on a, a medical scene? I'm not. Um, for goodness sakes, I only saved 10% of cardiac arrest on a good day. But I'll tell you what, um, I'll take the 10% chance, right? So I do think some people, you, you're going to lose people. Um, you're going to lose people. But I don't think it's a foregone conclusion, and I think they are highly preventable. But of course, there's always those exceptions but you don't know right yeah well let me, i don't want to miss a chance to do this and that is you model some conversations now I, before we do that i want to say that if you get your heart right yeah i, I um not that it's all about feelings because that's not what i'm talking about but just getting we all know police officers like touchy feelings <laughs> the more touchy feel the better right yeah right the um <laughs> one thing is but i like the phrase get your heart right it's like get your thinking right, get your heart right. Um, I believe that anyone, like all, all my peer support team members and most of the cops I know of are capable of having an authentic talk with another cop. In order to do that, I think you need to get your thinking right and your heart right. How they do that, I'm not sure. I have some ideas. Also, meant you mentioned try to be fact-based. So you're making observations about things that you see here. Something else that I have found really useful for every time I deal with an officer that might be suicidal or at great risk, I 
probably deal more with coworkers that are worried about them. And so we reach out to them in whatever way is appropriate. But one thing I always encourage them to do is to reach out themselves and also that they have rights as a good friend and to voice that. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you're going to send me a cryptic text about this or that, and then you don't respond to my text, how is that for our friendship? That kind of thing, you know? And I, I use different kinds of threats when I, threats in the sense that you respond to this text or I'm going to come looking for you. And if I have to come looking for you, that means I'm going to have to involve other people. And, you know, that kind of raises there. But my guess, my point is we don't have to get it exactly right. And don't let the language paralyze us so much that we don't act, that we're so afraid of getting the language just wrong a little bit. It's mostly getting your heart right, get your thinking right. And in some cases, you need to be emboldened to impose yourself on someone you're concerned about. So talk to us okay. about two things. What is the, some of the preferred language we should use? Yep. I heard you say death by suicide. Uh, I think you don't use terms like kill themselves. Or I don't, I'm not Have sure. used kill themselves? I don't use commit because that denotes okay, a sinner or crime. Ah, I see. Uh, and you commit somebody somewhere against their will. Um, so, yeah, so, so that's one of the ones so just, I will So just for, take this opportunity to tell us a little bit about the phrases, the language around this topic that I think are more useful. And then can we model some conversations? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, so the, the words in a, the no words, I call them. And I forgive people who use them because they're so ingrained, right? Sure. Uh, it takes a, it took me a long time to get them out of my, my vocabulary. Vocabulary? Vocabulary. Well, but, yeah, like that was Elmer <laughs> Fudd imitation, just so you know. Um, but anyway, how did I do? <laughs> um, so commit denotes a sin, a crime, uh, or you commit somebody somewhere against their will. Suicide is attempting suicide is not a crime anywhere in the United States. And some people are surprised, even law enforcement officers to know that I once had a, a police chief, um, who uh, challenged me on that and um, was insistent. And just, how I nicely yeah, say he did while I was talking and then he never said anything else about it. Mm -hmm. Um, there was one last place in the United States that suicide was attempting suicide was illegal until 2016, and now it's not anymore. It was a U.S. military uniform code of justice. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I had 20 military and, and active military and veteran suicides a day. I think it was great that they uh, took that law off the books because people were not getting help because they were afraid of repercussions, right? Sure. Um, so anyway, that's the commit piece. Yeah. I just say um, killed themselves, died by suicide. Sometimes I say suicided. Yeah. Uh, so a verb all of in itself. Okay. Um, I don't like to say failed attempt because people inevitably go to, oh, well, I can't even do that, that right, right? It just leads to negative thinking. Uh, I don't use successful attempt because there is nothing successful about suicide. In fact, it's actually, there's only one kind of successful suicide attempt, and that's the one that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> because you're alive. Mm -hmm. That's success. But that'll confuse people if we say it right. right. So we won't. Um, and then there's the completed suicide attempt. And that's often one that people started saying, but it, and it's hard to get out of your vocabulary because complete to me denotes success or you're a finisher, you're a doer. Oh. I just say a lethal attempt and a non-lethal attempt. It's actually very succinct and to the point. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody knows what you're talking about immediately. You don't have to tap dance around it. Lethal attempt, the non-lethal attempt. And so those are the, what I call the no words. Yeah. Um, so you want to talk about. So there's two things. One is um, if a person, an individual listening to this or someone that, uh, or, or whatever, if they felt hopeless, helpless, worthless, they felt that they were at risk. My thought about that is um, don't trust your own desire to isolate, uh, drink too much, or even entertain the thought of suicide, Go speak, express your thoughts to some another human. Yeah. And that might be a phone call to a helpline, that type of thing. But let's move. Do you agree with that? I agree with that 100%. National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, I'd have to... Um, well, let's... let's um, I wanna, we'll end with the resource. Maybe yeah. tell me which one that you want to... There's also a line called Cop to Cop. It's a national um, line answered by peers. And so we can look up that number maybe. Um, so that's helpful too, answered by a peer 24 hours a day. Okay. 
So we'll look that up or maybe we'll post some. Um, but let's talk about a conversation where you feel that you are alarmed and you want to impose yourself. I, I use the word impose myself because it feels like that. And I, I kind of want to push people past that hesitation that, yes, it's going to be, a, might be uncomfortable, but you have to take some action. What are those conversations like? Well, first off, they're hard. the closer you are to somebody, the harder those conversations are because you have skin in the game, right? You care about them, okay. including a coworker. Sure. You care about people you work with. I do. I, I know you do. So uh, other people must too. Um, <laughs> it's hard to ask somebody. Um, so, and if somebody's mad at you when you ask, to me, that means they're more at risk. That's a defense mechanism. People don't get angry for that kind of thing if there isn't something that's cutting deep about it, right? And I'd rather have people mad at me than dead. I can live with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to sleep if you're dead. That's going to affect me. Um, so how, how do you have that conversation with somebody? Uh, well, you sit them down, ideally in a, a quiet place, and you just ask them straight out. You talked before about what not to do. You did a great example of that. You're not thinking of doing anything stupid like, because I'm telling you, you're dumb if you tell me yes. And if that your impulse is to talk like that, we get it. It's it's uncomfortable. You're, you're, You'll slip. You'll probably slip. Right. But, but, but if you catch yourself, at least, that's the start. But what are you trying to say then? I'm going to look at you and I'm going, to, and I like, I like to quantify it with observational behavior, factual, right? Please get that. You say that all the time. You tell sure. people why you pulled them over, right? Right. You saw their taillight was out. They rolled through the stoplight. Sure. You know, all that stuff. Yeah, fact-based. So, yeah, fact-based, factual. So, you know, you've been talking a lot about not wanting to be around. I noticed that your uniform is usually meticulous, and lately it hasn't been. And you're late to work. And that's not you. When people do and say those things, sometimes they're thinking about killing themselves. Are you thinking about killing yourself? And then just let it hang. Don't fill that void with uh, babble, I guess. Right, because Nervous people want to people wanna fill it, right? Yeah. You're going to have to sit on your, well, I'm going to sit on your hands. You're going to have to bite your tongue. They will fill it. But you got to wait. And if they say yes... Now we've got our answer, yeah. and we go on to, do you have a plan of how you would do that? And that's perfectly appropriate. And the more defined the plan, it's not that we don't get worried if you don't have a plan. We do. But the more defined, the more worried I get. And then if you have a plan, do you have the things to carry out your plan? And then we start thinking about means restriction that kind of a thing, right? Like, how can we make that person safe? Uh, those kinds of questions. If people like you uh, who work with officer wellness would be a good referral. Mental health professionals, EAPs, um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Uh, all these things could be good resources. Yeah, so, okay, so that conversation you use the words, the words don't cause it. Um, you try to be fact-based. And if they acknowledge that, certainly people can say what they want. Mm -hmm. um, but if they acknowledge that they are affirmative to those things, essentially you don't, you want to leave, you don't want to leave them unescorted, so to speak. So right. you want to <laughs> remain with them and you might, and then two, you you may tell them, well, I'm going to remain with you. I want to stay with you until we can get you to a better spot or get the help get you some help kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, never leave somebody alone. Uh, um, I'd, I'd say obviously, but I've, I've seen people do it. Sure. Um, by and large, I think law enforcement officers know better than that. Uh, but can you escort them somewhere to safety or can you be with them when they call somebody, their therapist or a family member who will care for them or whatever it takes. Right. Call right. the number together. Yeah. Um, call a family member or a loved one. Who, who can we call? Who can we talk to? Have you felt this way before? And what have you done before? When Have you ever been in this situation? That's a great question. And, and what have you done before that makes you feel better or helps, yeah. right? Yeah. And then if it's reasonable, do that. And you said earlier that time is your friend too. So yes. sometimes turning the pain volume down 
uh, it might be enough to get them so that they can get back into their thinking brain or their healthier part of their brain, and then and you can develop a plan of just a little better recovery. Um, one thing I just will mention that um, for law enforcement, I'm afraid that sometimes cops will forget their fundamental police skills and forget to call for help when they need help. Because they are the help. Right. And so seriously, there <laughs> are, there's been, I've received phone calls where I say, you, you need to stop talking to me. You need to call 911 because it's such a crisis that I understand why they were kind of trying to lowball it, but that right. wasn't, the, it was an immediate crisis. One thing I will say too, and I know this petrifies people, is the thought of being hospitalized. Yeah. Now, one thing I will, a couple of observations I made about that one is anybody that cares for other public safety workers should think ahead about where you would bring them to be hospitalized because it seems very reasonable. You may not want to obviously go to the place where they work. That's very respectful, but it also requires that you think about this stuff ahead of time, which I think is our responsibility as peer support team members or EAP directors or whatever, even supervisors sometimes. So think about that ahead of time. But I would, I, I would say that just to quickly interject. Sure. Uh, Brian, if you had a heart attack, do you know what hospital you'd go to? I bet you do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why is it any different? Sure. Well, what I'm just saying is that you want to, you don't want them sitting in a lobby of a, oh, yeah. of a hospital that yeah. they may see coworkers, that type of thing. Of course. Um, and then the other thing is um, I had one officer tell me, because I was somewhat apologetic about them going to a hospital and needed to be hospitalized because it was such a crisis. And they're like, it was actually, I felt really safe there. It was really an interesting response. I mean, they felt in such crisis that the hospital was actually the best spot for them. Sure. And that, you know, that was a good for me to hear that, recognize that. So if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to, yeah, thanks. If you wanted to um, see some of this behavior modeled, um, that that conversation you had, where could someone find that? Is there? I well, I have a little ditty on my YouTube channel. Yeah, would you tell us about uh, that? So if if you go to uh, our YouTube ch channel, Minnesota Center for Suicidology, uh, we do have some videos. We have a quick five minute vignette. Uh, we did a um, we got a small grant uh, to help uh, a large ambulance service in the area, uh, and. Um, established peer support line and some really good training, uh, what's called assist and safe talk, which are evidence-based suicide recognition and prevention training that are helpful not only for peers, but also for the people that you come in contact with. Uh, but anyway, we did a little ditty myself and a board member, Br Brittany Misquick, sure. uh, on that. It's just five minutes. Yeah. Uh, and we were two paramedics in an ambulance and we had the conversation together and you'll see it modeled. Uh, now that could just as easily be in a squad car or in a break room or, mm -hmm. or something else. Uh, so, um, but that's, that's a place you can hear it model or, you know, I, I strongly recommend taking an assist class. You'll, you'll be able to model it. So I'll clarify those two things. What's the name of the class? Uh, assist, uh, applied suicide, uh, intervention and skills training. It's a 16 okay. hour course, uh, that we do offer, right? It's a, by an outfit called living works. Think of it like the, um, CPR of mental sure. health. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it's it's the literally how to talk someone off a bridge, how to establish rapport, right. the way to ask questions. But there's also a smaller version called Safe Talk, uh, which is also very good. Um, a lot of times the gatekeepers or people, who, uh, supervisory people would do like assist and then other people would use like Safe Talk, but it's valuable for anybody. Uh, and then um, I'm trying to think that I mentioned something else. My little train left the station. Well, but then also your <laughs> website too. Oh, um, right now it's suicide research that all run org. Soon it will be MN suicidology dot org. Uh, we'll probably have a redirect there. We're still um, fresh into the rebrand. So, yeah. Um, but in the meantime, you'll be able, and you can follow us on Facebook too and see okay. what we're doing. Um, so that's good. I think uh, maybe you and I could make one too uh, for the law enforcement. We talked about that. However, if you're going to pretend to be a St. Paul cop, you're going to have to lose the goatee. No. Can't we just make an exception? Can I have like a note? Well, from there's some departments that allow it. So. Well, we could do some other. Would that be sacrilege to do it with a different department? Maybe we're, maybe I'm with a different department and we met at the oh, border. I like huh? that. I yeah, like that yeah, because yeah, yeah. one of the peer support things that um, we do here is we have a peer support support. 
So we do. That's actually what you're coming to Wednesday. Oh yeah, yeah. is a peer support support. Everybody who's cool is going to be there. Oh. <laughs> um, yes, because I had to change the room. So a couple <laughs> things I just want to mention. I know there are some great organizations that take this very seriously and are very reputable. Um, I didn't research those ahead of time before this, but you mentioned two, and I just want to follow up on that. Sure. One is the National Suicide Prevention Hot Lifeline. Yes. And I've got the number in front of me, unless you do too. I do too. Go ahead. You say it. Uh, 1-800-273-8255. And that's 1-800-273-TALK. Okay. Uh, and then there's um, a couple of different lines, for, three different for public safety. Uh, there is COP to COP, which is 81866-COP-COP, number two, COP, COP to COP. Uh, there's also COP line, 1-800-267-5463, 1-800-267-5463. And then there's something called Safe Call Now, one two zero six. Four five nine three zero two zero, and that's for all public safety workers, including dispatch, which uh, oftentimes the, I call them the great forgotten. Sure. Also, apps, PTSD coach for free, and my favorite, virtual hope box, uh, which is also free. So the the conclusion is there's a lot of resources, um, yeah. and those that are concerned about this for others can look into that ahead of time if they wish, and those that are suffering can find it quite quickly, usually, if they're... Correct. And if you say to Siri, I'm thinking of killing myself, yeah, she will ask if you want her to dial the Suicide Prevention Lifeline number. Really? And on Facebook, if you post something, yeah, you'll start seeing it come up on your feed on the right-hand side, the number. Good. Um, one thing I meant to ask you, but can you just list some preventative protective factors um, to just sure. throw those out there too, because uh, the reason I say that is one is as, as painful and as uh, your, some of your personal experiences and the experience of people that suffer this, there's a lot of good information. There's a lot of hope. There's a lot of good recovery. There's a number of success stories. Mm -hmm. um, there's reasons to have some uh, optimism, even as individuals that suffer, that they're going to get to a better spot, you know? Yeah. And, um, and it, beca it becomes a pa part of their past. Now, some people live with it every day, as you mentioned, but then they even manage that. But what are some of the protective or preventative factors? I guess, I guess protective factors is probably the better word. I think of it a lot, like just to use an analogy, like heart disease, right? There's things you have um, control over, things you don't. But so we want to concentrate on those things that we have control over. Epictetus. Right? What's that? Uh, Epictetus, the Greek. Oh, the yes, Stoic yes, philosopher. yes, yes. <laughs> the Stoics, right? Yeah. Uh, Minnesota bait culture is based all on them. But anyway, <laughs> um, so things like um, cardio and fitness, physical fitness, the yeah. things that prevent heart disease help prevent men, uh, mental illnesses and keep you mentally healthy. Sure. Eating right. I mean, this, I mean, this almost sounds so cliche, but eating right, getting sleep. Taking care of yourself, um, doing things you enjoy. Uh, there's more to life than just your job. Those are protective. The social connections. In fact, there's a researcher named, uh, it's a hyphenated name, Holt Lindstedt, that uh, found that uh, having an adequate relationship with one other person, just adequate, was more protective mm -hmm. and la made your li you um, improved your lifespan longer than quitting smoking or eating properly. And I didn't say go eat and whatever you want and smoke, sure. but also smoking cessation is a good idea. I know. Yeah. Gasp. Um, you know, those are things that you can do. Mindfulness. Sure. Um, some people like yoga. Some people think it's touchy feely and don't do it. I guess the name of the game is whatever makes you feel good. That's not maladaptive. Drinking is not make you feel right. good. <laughs> well, and I think um, you mentioned, uh, I mean, I haven't, the book, my book, the Good Cop, Good Cop book, we very intentionally, it's a focus on behavioral health, mental and emotional well-being, but we very intentionally included topics of nutrition, exercise. Yeah. There's a whole chapter just devoted to sleep, a whole chapter just devoted to alcohol. Yeah. Um, that type of stuff. Because, you know, obviously you see that uh, these things are holistic, to use that phrase. So Yeah, no, that's all um, very important. Uh, whenever you try to pick anything else, out by itself, 
you find it hitched to everything else in the universe. That was John Muir, the naturalist, not me, but uh, I think it's true. Yeah. Well, we don't have a fact checker right now, so you could have taken credit for that. Somebody's probably out there checking. Um, I hope. <laughs> so uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, you might be interested in, in the book that I mentioned, Good Cop, Good Cop, A Get Healthy, Stay Healthy Guide for Law Enforcement, and um, which covers a number of topics that we did today and a number of uh, other ones as well. And you can put, purchase that on, on Amazon. And um, you can also find out more information at goodcopgoodcop.com. I think that, that web address is a little easier than yours. Um, Probably. Yeah. So... So, Chris, what were you saying, Terry? Yeah, you have your. I guess we get, you got your web address out, did you? We did. Yep. Okay. We got it. Yep. All right. Thank you. Appreciate the work you're doing. It's good work. Uh, daily good is a lifetime of great. Um, I like it. So, uh, we should all underachieve a little bit uh, and just do good work. Uh, so. I'm just right. joking, of course, but thank you for that. And uh, I look forward to seeing you Wednesday We're, for our peer team. You're going to come and talk to the uh, the metro region, you know, the peers in the whole region. So Yeah, myself and um, Brittany Miskwick as yeah. well, who's a licensed clinical social worker on my board and is a, um, a licensed, clin or a, I'm sorry, a uh, suicidologist. Uh, so that's a, that's a rare combination. You get a mental mm -hmm. health provider, or yeah. a professional crossed with the suicidologist researcher. So we're glad to have her, and she's uh, anybody who's seen her before knows she's she's good. She knows what she's talking about. Well, and there's individuals out there that are suffering the negative consequences of this stigma, but we are, I believe, we're making great progress uh, regarding that. People are talking more openly about some of these issues, and just the fact that you're out here and we're doing this podcast, and the number of people interested in the course coming up on Wednesdays so, and all that. Yeah, stuff. no, that's awesome. It's all a right. change in the culture. All right, all right, progress. Thanks, Chris. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you for having me.